I'm live at the Red House with Lauren Dubinsky. What's up? What's up? Thanks for coming over. Thanks for having me. This is very cool. Yeah, I'm having you. You're the following episode from uh, from Max's episode recently. Yes. Uh, I'm, Which was great. I enjoyed listening to it. I enjoyed having him over. Yeah. I'm I'm flexing my fancy groceries. I love this is right my now. favorite hat that we've <laughs> yeah. ever had. I love this hat. I saw it on Instagram and yeah. I was like, I am going to go buy that hat. That's and, so nice. Yeah. <laughs> I have not yet acquired one for myself. Occasionally, if a hat w- doesn't sell, I get it. Mm. Every now and then, I get gifted, like an extra. Nice. And this one is too nice for me to have. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I love it. Choc- I anything chocolate brown, that's like my favorite yeah. color. Yeah, yeah, I love this hat. Uh, I, I don't know. It, the spirit of it, the campiness of it. Well, it's got like the uh, chain stitching, mm-hmm. the red, love red. Look, it's basically my shoe as a hat. Boom. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. So I got to hear all about Max's sort of journey to fancy groceries, which of yeah. course you were a big part of. But yeah. Uh, I would like to hear more about what it is that you're doing in Winston-Salem and what it is you're trying to do Mm. and your story and everything. Yeah. So let's start with what you're doing. So I'm essentially at this point trying to spend as much time outside as possible. So a lot of things are part of that. I knew a couple of years ago that I wanted to try to grow as much of my food as I could. Really not for any particular reasons, kind of for shits and giggles. Mm. I was like, this sounds cool. If I could like have a year where I grew my own food and like I had no context for, is that easy? Is it hard? Is it possible? And I just thought I would try and it took a couple years to get there. So I spent a lot of time in the garden, like a ton, Um, or like learning how to can or learning how to save seeds. And then, um, I think I am a little bit of a compulsive sharer, so it's actually super annoying. Like when I learn something, I ha- like I have to tell somebody else about it, and I've always been that way. <laughs> so that's turned into me doing all kinds of silly things like uh, teaching classes to just whoever from the internet wants to show up and like learn about soil science or how to save seeds or how to do garden planning because I'll just spend a couple years studying it and then I'm like, great, I should teach a class and tell other people (laughs) what I've learned. So I teach some classes, which is fun. Um, And then I just made it really official this year and started a company called Floricult, which is just short for floriculture, um, like the study of flowers. And now I'm doing like garden design, garden consulting, helping people start to grow their own food or put in perennial flower gardens. Um, A lot of people want to learn how to homestead. Mm -hmm. So like just collaborating with people to make that happen. I'm like dipping my toe into landscaping, which is weirdly a lot more fun than I would have thought. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And then I write a weekly newsletter. And it's mostly like education on how to grow stuff and then sometimes my own thoughts and feelings like today's made their made their way in there. So, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, there's so much there to, mm. to follow. Um, I think one, let's start here because we can build to some other, uh, like I came into this conversation just geared up and ready to ask like a hundred different things. Great. But first I want to hear more about, uh, like how you went from one world to this one Mm -hmm. and like what that transition was like. And I think what Max said, if I remember correct, was that you came from like the marketing industry and then you took this hard turn into this other thing. That's to me sounds like very different worlds to inhabit. Mm. I wonder what that was, what that was like. Uh, It depends on the day. I think I answer that question very differently on the day and how I feel. I, you know, when we meet someone, we sort of collect information and think like, okay, they do this job, they live this place, they're this old, and what and more like we categorize them. Mm-hmm. But when you're that person and you're living, you don't really think that way. You're just like, man, every day I try to like get through this stuff and get to the <laughs> next thing. And like, maybe I have some ideas. So to me, I've always been someone, and I had some sort of breaks, but I've always been a person that's like trying to grow stuff or learn things in the world of science. Mm. And it is true that I accidentally uh, fell into advertising about 15 years ago. And 
uh, you cannot half-ass advertising. Mm. You are like fully in it or you are not in it at all. And so I have been probably whole and a half assing advertising for the last <laughs> for the last 15 years. Um, and it was a combination of being very lucky and just working very hard. Um, I helped build an advertising agency in Los Angeles for the seven years that we were there mm. um, and kind of saw it through two really big acquisitions. Uh, really bananas that anyone let me have that much like decision-making power or responsibility. <laughs> I think by the age of 28, I had hired over 50 people and I had probably fired a dozen. Mm. Um, both of those are really like draining and difficult, but they taught me a lot of good lessons. Uh, and then I knew that I wanted to leave LA and through a friend got a really cool job offer here. And that's how we ended up here. Um, I actually tried to take a break from advertising and went to go work for a manufacturing company. Great job. I didn't love the company. So after a year and a half, I met um, the guy who owned an advertising company here. And so I've been there for the last three years. And it's been great. Um, but like the world is challenging and advertising is challenging. And so I think sometime last year, I just knew like, oh, there's kind of a an end to yeah. this um and it's really hard to tell when things should end i have like no advice for people on how to do that like how to know when to <laughs> do the next thing yeah um i just say start doing start doing little pieces of what you want to do so i left i resigned in february so it's been about four months um huge day-to-day -day life change like dramatic um but as far as my headspace, I don't know. It feels kind of like it's always been here. Mm -hmm. It's nice. That is, uh, that's kind of what I was most curious about. I think mm. headspace and happiness and career yeah. and like what matters and stuff. And yeah. I get the sense right now that there's this, this, this motion underneath us that's happening. That's like drawing a lot of people back toward the earth and drawing yeah. people toward like, yeah. Having their hands dirty, being connected to the food that they eat. This idea of homesteading. I yeah. mean, like, it's n no joke. Like, just numerous people in yes. my life, it just, like, it, as soon as COVID happened or something, just, they just, it, a, a switch went off in their heads, including yeah. my own, that was just like, oh, shit, like, life is finite. Our time is finite. And, like, we aren't, like, we're mortal. And like, we have to do yeah. something about this or whatever. Yes. It really made a lot of people, I think, get back in touch with earth. And, um, I don't know, I guess like when you talk about your state of mind changing, having do like kind of gone into this, uh, well, maybe I can just invite you to elaborate on that. Yeah. Uh, there's so many different pieces of it for me, I think. You know, sitting in a chair all day is not great for you. And in, in its simplest, like the simplest way to answer is moving your whole body is like very important to being a living thing. And it's very important to even being like mentally well. Mm. Uh, three or four years ago, I started having like severe memory issues. And I was always someone with a great memory. And so this was like kind of an identity crisis for me. <laughs> Um, and it hasn't really come all the way back yet, but I'm really kind of convinced it was because I just like, wasn't physically doing what I needed to with my body. And like, maybe it's food, maybe it's environment, maybe it's stress. It could be a lot of things. Um, and spending all of my day, like being up and physically doing things, it is like, I'm working harder than I've ever worked and I'm less stressed than I've ever been. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting to me. Um, and I, I don't know. I just think life is probably a lot better that way. Um, I, you know, I hear, I hear a lot of, as soon as people are like, oh, you're, you garden, that's so cool. Or like you teach people how to grow things. That's so cool. Most people say, oh, I can't keep anything alive. Like I have a black thumb. This is really hard. And I think that's really interesting because um, about 
I like sort of at the end of the world wars, which is like our, what our grandparents generation, great grandparents generation, like more than half of produce in America was coming from people growing it at home. Hmm. Like more than half is a lot. That really is a lot. That's a lot. Um, and so to, you know, when you study history and when you study people, it's very fascinating to me that in such a remarkably short period of time, you can grow from basically everyone growing their own food and being very physically active to our generation thinking like, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And there's some real limitations which around like property and wealth inequality and, and health and a lot of things, but like just the mental approach to like, this is too hard. I'm not this person. I have a black thumb. It's like, there are people that can and can't. That's really interesting mm -hmm. um, to me. So everyone, everyone can like, it's, it's like saying I can't drink water. <laughs> Drinking water is a challenge for me. Uh, no, I got like a dry thumb. <laughs> yeah. Like we're people like we're, we're meant to grow things like things want to grow. Yeah. Um, so it's not surprising to me that everyone feels that. And even when you study like what stays in your DNA, mm. like what gets passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. It makes a ton of sense to me that all of us in our physical selves are feeling like there's this huge part of us that's missing and we need to go back and find it. A hundred percent. Yeah. I definitely agree. I mean, that's definitely what I've been feeling. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. My grandfather, both my grandfathers ha kept gardens, but one of them, uh, kept like the biggest garden I've seen an individual person keep, I think. That's and amazing. I don't know how he did it on his own. Do you uh, have like a sense of it. scale? And it's hard to estimate. I could show you where it is, where it was. Yeah. It, I don't know how to answer. I don't know how to tell you how big it was, but a lot bigger than mine, yeah. <laughs> as you just saw. <laughs> uh, but That's they, cool. they both, you know, they both come from, if they, they both come from time periods too, where they, mm -hmm. they at least ha if they weren't old enough to remember the great depression or whatever, they yeah. at least were raised with people that did, Yeah, you know, so like self-sufficiency to them was a whole different level of importance, I think, mm -hmm. than it is to us these days who yeah. are kind of have, have, we at least seem to believe we have everything we need at our disposal or whatever all yeah. the time. Yeah. And it's sad. It's kind of sad to me that, um, that like in just in my generation too, or just whatever, just for these modern generations, that that is something that we've failed to appreciate. And then we've just kind of like let fall by the wayside. Like it's some relic of the past. Yeah. I, um, I did a lot of reading during COVID like most of us. And I read a lot of like Wendell Berry, books and there's one he contributed to called letters to a young farmer which you should buy or I will gift you it's like one of the best things to read um and I remember so in one of them there's a great book that Wendell Berry wrote called the unsettling of America hmm. and he's a really interesting person because he is like part poetry and fiction but he's an academic and then he also is just uh a really good like personal slash nature writer and so it's usually those are three separate genres and it's rare to see them like all combined and so this book is you're jumping from like the history of the department of agriculture to his poetry about something and it's actually very emotional to mm. go to cycle through that um and i remember reading when we talk about like presidents getting elected and the cabinet being selected you know there's no one talks about the agriculture position. It's kind of like the transportation person. It's like, yeah, I don't know what they do. It's transportation, we have it. Farms, <laughs> we have them. And I remember in this book just reading kind of the decisions that were made at a government level through the 50s, 60s, and 70s that basically like eliminated farming in America, like at a personal and at a community level. Hmm. And it was almost comforting to me to know that like it wasn't us like we didn't decide to stop farming like we didn't decide to start doing other things like we didn't decide to lose this skill set uh, it was really intentional that's creepy it is creepy um it's i don't know it's it's a little depressing but it's also encouraging to read that 
when you understand how something happens, you can understand how to undo it, I think. I think that's what so many of us are floundering in. Mm. It's like, why does no one know? Why does no one have land? Why why does like 70% of our food come from the top 1% of farms? Why is 50% of what's grown in America corn and soybean? Like, and it's helpful yeah. to know why. That and, is, uh, and who's making those decisions. Yeah. Otherwise, we feel like it's a personal failure. Definitely. You know, you know like I should have stayed closer to my great grandparent and inherited this piece of land and not gone to school for this and learned how to farm that and I would have been happier. Like, you didn't have that choice. Someone else made that for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do think there's a lot of a sense of guilt that people can't have with them because they have this vision for their yeah. life or what they dream that it could be ideally and they don't quite know how to get to that space that that place that way of existing yeah and they do they care i care like i me and my family i know we've had discussions about this carrying around this sense of guilt of remembering how mm -hmm. uh sort of industrious our grandparents were and and being like god damn like how how did they how did they manage to know how to be so capable or whatever that's so interesting so like what did your parents do what did what do my parents do yeah well now or like when you were growing up kind of what kind what do you mean like career paths yeah career slash paths lifestyle lifestyle did they yeah have? yeah so <laughs> it's unfortunate really i don't i hope he probably won't hear this i don't want to put him on blast but like <laughs> my truth be told my dad so i grew up like right next door to my grandparents okay um the one who kept the really big garden okay he was so fucking ridiculous that he built just just because he wanted to build like this replica log cabin kind of thing. Mm. Um, he did. So not only did he have this giant garden back there, but he built a whole ass log cabin next door to him and uh, had this like whole country vibe going on yeah. in like North Winston Salem, like okay. almost downtown. Cool. So it was pretty peculiar. Uh, so anyway, when he passed in like 2008 or nine, my dad, who lived next door in that cabin, he kind of took over the place and took over the responsibility of, of taking care of my grandmother. Mm. But uh, the place, he just didn't, I guess, didn't know how to maintain the same way that my grandfather did. Mm. My dad just like, isn't, he wasn't, he isn't retired. My grandfather was obviously retired by the time that he was gardening yeah. all the time and stuff. So, uh. Dad isn't retired. The place kind of grew up. The garden became a forest. Yeah. Um, a lot of the fields, there, the little fields that were open became new trees. Everything changed. And, uh, and it was not, he couldn't maintain that lifestyle that my grandfather had had. And then on the other side, just totally different, you know, like yeah. they're, my grandmother's super, <laughs> uh, super industrious and super like thrifty and stuff. But my grandfather was really the, the gardener. My grandmother's main task in the, in life is to like hide, hide food all over the house and like <laughs> keep him away from anything sweet or salty to oh keep him God, alive. Oh my God, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. I, I have so many thoughts about this. This is really interesting to me. First of all, I think it's fascinating that gardening became like a woman's thing mm. in our generation. Um, like to like millennials, to millennials. It? it's like, oh, you're gardening. Like that's a girl thing. Like having house plants is a girl thing. That's interesting to me um, because almost every friend of mine tells me a very similar story actually about their grandpa that had the biggest garden so much. In fact, that I, my friend group actually refers to me as grandpa Lauren. <laughs> Because I have a huge garden and I grow extra food and I give it away to my friends and I remind everyone of their grandpa, which yeah. is so great to me. Um, second of all, when I was growing up, my dad, uh, he's given me a few good things in life uh, and most of them are like interesting quotes to think about. Mm. One of them was, everything a man does is either because his father did or because his father didn't. Mm. And I think about that often. Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah. And I, th you know, when you grow up as a child, um, gardening and homesteading and being out and doing chores, 
you don't understand them. To you, they're this thing that you have to do that's standing between you and play. And so I know a lot of people that don't want to garden and don't want to be outside because they had one and their parents made them take care of it. Um, but that's that actually was more of the phenomenon with like our parents' generation. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of our parents were sort of anti-yard work, anti homesteading because they remember their parents and the weeding the infinite weeding uh that they had to do like the oppressive side of it yeah and like also um old school it's it's so fascinating to study the history so like people didn't used to grow in rows until i want to say like 40s 50s 60s like when big agriculture became a thing the only reason we grow in rows is for machinery not for people, like machines. So when our grandparents were gardening, they were like, great, rows. Um, And growing in ground is really nice, but in these really long rows, uh, so many weeds, the amount, it's so much space for actually how little you get out of it Mm. that, um, you know, they just didn't know better. This was like the remnant of monocropping, like big farms. And so it's way too much weeding for the amount that you get. Now people usually grow in like square foot gardens. That was kind of the movement that started in the 70s and 80s when like an engineer figured out rows are terrible. (laughs) We should grow in squares. Those damn engineers. Yeah. And so like I talk a lot of people too, they're like their expectation of a garden is just weeds. That's what they picture. And then when they understand they can do it in squares, they can get a lot more for a smaller space. Mm. Weeds are way less of a problem. So it's not, I'm sure there's other things going on with your dad same with mine but maybe he just didn't want to yeah what he had to do when he was a kid i think part that's probably part of it yeah not to mention all the other crazy shit that he is that he can be but uh yeah so i think that's pretty astute but the the girl the gender part i think is interesting too like yeah you're right i mean i noticed that as well like i think just in my immediate life with peers not so much with family members or whatever but Mm -hmm. with peers with friends I'm noticing a lot more of the women in my life who are being like, yes, and I'm doing the homestead yes. thing and I'm either persuading my husband to do it or I'm going to marry a dude that wants to do yeah. it or who knows what the fuck. But uh, it feels like, I don't know, there's this like feminine vibe of being in touch with earth that that men are, I hope, catching up to. Men are definitely catching up. Uh, what was this? We were tra- talking about men being three years behind. Right. Uh, <laughs> it is fascinating also because um, like gardening, domestic gardens, like ornamental gardens, I'm not growing corn and tomatoes, but the estate. Yeah. That's the, that is the most masculine thing when you study history. Like, Um, the peasants could not do that. It was kings and royalty that had exorbitant amounts of wealth and resources that created the gardens. Mm -hmm. Like the hanging gardens, well, it's not like some nice lady felt like gardening. Like this was a very masculine display of like power and wealth and control. Um, in America, I think our version of that for men is like turf, which is stupid, but, um, turf. Just grass, like having pristine grass. And I think that Uh same sense of which, and I'm not knocking to like have dominion over the earth. I'm not knocking the desire to sort of like master something and create something beautiful. But for some reason at this point in time in America, like the only way men know how to do it is through grass. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of women are like, hey, there are some better ways (laughs) to do this outside. Yes, I think it's... I can see that in some cases, I think it makes sense. Like thinking of people who have like a quarter acre. Yeah. Like I think they actually, now that I think about it, we can think on this, but my, my stepdad, I remember like, uh, he had a koi, we had a koi pond in our front yard that somebody else had put in, but he, he took pride in like making it look okay back in the day. Uh, where my first thought was, was like when you have a quarter acre and only very small parts of it are useful. I guess it makes sense where someone's like, my grass doesn't have weeds in it. And I have like four bushes in front of my windows. Isn't it nice? Yeah. And, and like, that's as, that's as much as they can do or yeah. are going to do. Um, but of course that you like, I've seen houses where people, I did some landscaping last year for a house that's probably on a quarter acre. And this dude, like 
maxed out every yeah. single portion that he could. He had the rose bushes. He had the nice bird bath. He had like he, everything. Yeah. He knew it, where, what every single plant in his yard was. And, yeah. You know, that's kind of cool. We only have a quarter acre. Yeah. It's very small. I was really, I watched a show called, uh, terrible name, Big Dreams, Small Spaces. Mm. Dead giveaway for the content. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, really, like, you know, in America, we don't really have celebrity horticulturalists, but in England, they do. 70% of people in England garden. Hmm. I think they define gardening a little bit differently, but um, yeah, Monty Don is like very famous in Europe and he has this, he has many shows. Um, and I watched it and realized I couldn't believe what people were doing with really small spaces. Cause like I grew up in Ohio, everyone has like an acre, you're surrounded by cornfields. It's super freaking flat. Like, huge amounts of grass and then like some people put in that massive like row garden mm. and that was kind of what i thought i needed to be able to grow um and you just like you just don't i mean people in almost every other country have very small amounts of property right and are very productive and useful with it for sure yeah yeah yes so then there's this question <laughs> of like <laughs> going back to where we were. There's a curiosity, I think, about masculinity. I've, I've like so I was thinking about this after talking to Max too. Like the ideas of what masculinity are, and of course they vary from culture to culture, and mm. and aspects of what masculinity is. Also, it's not like masculinity is one single thing, and it's not like it's owned necessarily by by men, you know, but. Regardless, what we're talking about, I think, is the idea of, like, the imposition of one's will onto the world and onto their surroundings, kind of. Mm -hmm. And mastering it is the word you used, which I definitely agree with. And I think there's, like, in my head, there's something that millennials have dealt with in a way that's sort of, like, whether it's cool or not, to not cool in moral terms, like, acceptable, but whether it's sure. literally cool, like the the cool thing to do yeah. um to impose your will on like designing and mastering your own life as opposed to being the uh the aloof person oh interesting i see where you're going with this i think that dudes could stand to uh be like be encouraged to impose their will on making their life better yes um Wow, there must be so many things influencing that as like a default behavior for so many people. I think um, the first thing that comes to mind is just being in school, which like I don't want to have a very complicated relationship with school because I was homeschooled my whole life. And so I always wished I could go to public school and I probably would have been a much healthier person had I been able to go to public school for at least a small amount of time. But I do know that it's like not healthy for children to be sitting indoors in chairs mm -hmm. for most of their childhood. And I think when you're forced to, to do something that is like so unnatural to you for so long, you develop very unhealthy coping skills that you usually are not aware of. And I think regardless of your gender and not just school, other things we've all gone through, like as we're becoming people, like we've all really had to teach ourselves how to like not care. Yeah. Like our generation in particular has done an, ex like we have put an extraordinary amount of effort into intentionally not giving a shit. Mm-hmm. That's really, really true, I think. Like as a survival skill. Um, and like when you watch kids, when I watch little boys and little girls, like so much energy, like so much desire to go do. Like one of my favorite things is to teach little kids how to garden and how to grow because if you have one experience of that being easy and successful as a kid, 
you absorb that into your identity without realizing it. You're mm-hmm. like, I can do this. This is a thing that happens. If you never have that experience, your first experience is like, I bought a basil plant from a greenhouse at Trader Joe's and it died. I can't do this. It's like, well, it's going to die anyways because like a whole other thing. So um, <laughs> it's just like very important that kids have the experience to grow stuff. They don't have to grow up on a farm, but like yeah. grow a few plants a few years of your childhood. Um, yeah, I don't know. Boys and girls, I think we all, particularly through high school, like we just really got trained that not caring is better. Yeah. I really, uh, I, I haven't like uh, researched any of this shit, you know, and I, I think yeah. I live in a world of, I might see patterns and I might think about my own relationship to them, but I don't, I'm not like reading psychology papers or any shit like that. Um, and you sound like uh, have, have, having heard that you're like more scientifically minded, I'm sure mm-hmm. you're, you come from a whole different way of looking at these things. But, uh, you know, I mean, I definitely remember relating to that. And I've heard some people talk about, especially with young boys, like how much, yeah. like how important, like, Oh, just, um, the way that they're being socialized and the way that like they have been being socialized for a really long time and the, the like almost like tyrannical control, the, the, the approach that we've been engaging in for quite a while now with kind of like exerting control over them rather than kind of like, uh, like harnessing that energy yeah. and like, like teaching them to exist within it in a productive way. Yeah. I, I want to be really careful to not like knock public education because it's saving a lot of children and, and it should be a very good thing. Um, and I think what's predominantly missing from education is context. And I think of context being a very feminine thing. Hmm. And I think a lot of what's happening in our schools is a little bit more linear, which tends to be like a a masculine concept feminine things like a lot more change like a lot more context a lot more cyclical things um nature is very like cyclical and interwoven and like no one's gonna learn how to divide (laughs) unless you're trying to understand like i grew all these tomatoes i want to give them to my friends (laughs) Joey hit me last year because he didn't get enough. <laughs> and he thought that I liked Samantha more than him. You know, we try with these like pitiful like sentences in our textbooks. Right. Like that's not real. Like we need the we need the real example of like, how do you divide 40 tomatoes among my six friends? Mm-hmm. And we need we need the context of like, wow, look at all that green stuff out there. Like, I wish I could grow a garden. How big is it? And like, what if I want to do it diagonally? That makes math really interesting. Yeah. And I just think the way that it's being taught usually is not interesting. That is cool to, uh, so. yeah, that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. The, the, the linear versus yeah. the contextualized. Kids love to solve problems. Yeah. Like solving problems, the feeling you get when you like solve a problem. Yeah, and our stupid math textbooks is like, solve 32 problems. Like, fuck me, those are not problems. Like, that's just, like, annoying <laughs> shit that you're making yeah. me do. Yeah, I, I went to a, I went to, a, I was in public school briefly, but um, yeah. I went to a private school that was way worse than the public schools that I would have gone to mm-hmm. otherwise. I went to, like, a tiny little Christian school. Yeah. And. Uh, Classic. Yeah. Like, I'll. Any regular listeners, I'll spare the <laughs> repeat of the story. But you it's didn't just, get world class education. No, I sure didn't. What no. a bummer! They they really like thought that was secondary to indoctrination. Sure. And so um, I got a pretty deep indoctrination, but I didn't yeah. get that great of an education. So, anywho, um, I'm not knocking educational institutions either uh and i don't know what the best answer is but i I think like it makes sense to me why somebody came up with this idea that what we should do is sit everybody down and tell them to shut the hell up and or else they'll get yelled at or sent somewhere where an authority figure will yell at them uh and then they and then have them come back and sit down 
And for 30 yeah. minutes that day, we'll let them run around and have fun. But for the rest of the time, they're going to be miserable. Yeah. I can understand why somebody came up with that <laughs> <laughs> that plan. I don't like that plan, though. Sure. I think it could have been better. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's interesting. Yeah, I don't the the masculinity femininity thing is interesting. Um, I don't even know. I read this really cool book a long time ago called Male Female, and it's by an anthropologist who went and studied like a lot of different cultures specifically to try to understand like what were feminine traits and what were masculine traits in different cultures at different times during the world. Um, and it was basically like these are all man made like very fabricated ideas, which you kind of alluded to. And they are so wildly different. Like in, in a lot of other cultures, um, strength, bravery, courage, even like violence, aggression, those are feminine traits. And nurturing, being protective, um, caring for things, being more of like just a consistent worker, like those are masculine traits. And that's really interesting to see how different that is from some of these predominantly like um, European influenced countries. Uh, Judeo-Christian influenced countries so so where do you stand on that like where do you land in terms of what you when you when you use the words like masculine or feminine how are you using those I guess in context what are, what are your, the definitions that you're working with or is it more like assuming that we're using the same language because yeah. we're living in this culture or whatever well in the words of Max Davinsky masculinity is stupid <laughs> I laughed, so, say that. <laughs> I laughed so hard when I heard that. Um, I don't have a, I don't really have a definition or thought as to them. You know, I'm the oldest of four kids and I grew up in a deeply religious home. Mm. And I was probably what you would describe as a tomboy. And someone should have recognized very early in my life that I was not uh, the straightest woman. <laughs> and gender is really complicated and like very, and like the idea of like femininity and masculinity in that, it's just like I don't see positive outcomes when those concepts are introduced. Like I'm not sure the purpose of them. Mm. I don't, you know, in high school, I did speech and debate, and my dad wanted me to pursue a career in politics. And um, the one thing I learned from traveling nationally and doing debate was that no one wins because they're right. No one wins because they're persuasive. No one wins because they have the best evidence. Debates and arguments are won and lost on definitions and, like, technicalities of like the laws of the game. Hmm. And that I think really made me lose my interest in in arguing with people and in like the political kind of spectrum. And, and I always think about anytime I'm having a conflict with someone or I'm struggling to like connect with somebody, I just think about like, wow, do we even have the same definition of this thing? Um, and usually you don't, like usually that's, a lot of the problem yeah and I think I think that's because people know like if you have a really clear definition like you can control the issue you can like move things to where you want so it's probably all of our desire to like define masculinity to define femininity to define gender to define sex because if you can name it if you can define it if you can get everyone to agree like you can really influence it and control it you can have power over it um, so, I, yeah. Well, I think, too, you can breed cooperation. You can, like, breed understanding That's true. with people. You know, like, if we agree That's true. on what something like, what your personal boundaries are for how, like, what whatever conversation we're going to have or whatever is, like, fun for you to talk about or whatever. Yes. If I, if I don't, if I can participate in understanding those boundaries, it yes. makes it a lot easier for me to know how to interact with you or whatever. hundred percent. You know, so I think that that's what I see happening politically too, uh, is like, I think actually, I think actually the opposite in a way can be true. Like mm. if you can, if you can deny someone agreement of a definition, if you can take mm. that away from someone, that's another way to control, uh, sort of how the conversation goes, you know, and, to be frank, I think that that's happened quite a lot uh, over the last few years, like kind of 
with with language changing in an almost Orwellian yes. way, like language being twisted to the degree where, where we're not talking the same language anymore on the on the political divide. I too like don't I don't relate to people who find that that satisfies their identity to like yeah. think of themselves as I'm I'm this political identity and I engage in the world as that in opposition to the opposite of me or yeah. whatever. Yeah. I don't fuck with that. But uh <laughs> I do like I like the definition part. Like I really I'm trying to actually in just my personal life, I find myself often like almost opining like people's true selves mm -hmm. and looking at them and being like, Man, I just wish I wish I could convince you in some way to like not give a shit about politics for like a day so we could just have like a nice time yeah. together and not talk about that shit and we could be actual humans. I find myself like wanting really badly to get people to like lose that that sense of identity. Uh yes. It's not my place to like wish that on people, but it's just I just find it poisonous. I just find I find ide ideological commitments like super fucking poisonous. There's so much fear. And I struggle with that because being well educated and having opinions about things in a big way is my way of protecting myself. Mm -hmm. Cuz I was really unsafe for most of my life. Mm. And I I couldn't ever say I don't really know about blah, 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 but this is how I feel. You weren't you know? allowed to say no, things like that? No. And that's not unique to me. A lot of us grew up into people that way. Yeah. Not being safe to say, like, I don't know, and I can't defend this, and I'm sure it's, you know, wrong or confusing, but, like, I feel... And you know, you learn that there's consequences for like expressing how you feel and yeah, you arm yourself. Yeah. And it sucks. And you brought that up at an interesting time. I mean, is that what you, cause that is a part of what I've heard, like ideologies, for example, mm. are meant to do is like to help us uh, sort of manage our nervous system. And is that kind of oh, what you're talking about? Interesting. No, but tell me about that. Well, I've thought I've tried to unpack it myself for a while, and I think it kind of makes sense. I mean, there's God, we could go down quite a path with this, <laughs> but there's like the moral makeup idea. Um, yeah. You know, like basically the idea that humans are not a blank slate when they're born, that they do have like a moral sort of equipment that they're born with and okay. that they're kind of like nurtured that they nurture throughout their lives. Okay. So for example, just one point of example, there's like apparently five, I think dominant traits in this model of morality, the moral okay. makeup. One of them being, uh, the idea of uh, the, the, the sense of the sense of being open to new experiences. Mm. So like, if you take a per, so, so generically speaking, a conservative person is somebody yeah. who's probably less likely to be open to new experiences where a liberal person is probably more so. Um, so then when you take that way of existing, you take that truth about yourself. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm somebody who's really open to uh, new experiences. Yeah. We don't just live in our psychological reaction to things. We also kind of paint a story onto the world uh, that like tells the story that we're trying to live. So then we tell this story that um, that it's good to be open to new experiences and that it's like not good to be closed off to to new experiences. Oh, I see what you're saying. So then when you when you kind of tell that story to yourself and that's the story that you're a character in your your nervous system understands that as a positive reinforcement as a positive thing that you that produces like dopamine or whatever in your brain to to be to know that you're experiencing new things <laughs> and that you're open to it so then uh then there's this identity that you have as an option which is liberal person which is like hey here's all these things that have been discovered over time that allow you to like yeah experience that feeling of being open to new experiences you can just do that through this like political identity and this social identity or whatever. You can do it through this identity that already exists. You can just plug that in and kind of 
uh, act like that person, and then your brain mm -hmm. is getting what it wants. That's kind of what I was, what I'm getting at as far as like. Uh, well, I'm gonna have to noodle on that one for a while. That's very interesting. Ideology related to the nervous system, I think, is what we were talking about. Yeah, so that's yeah. the best I can unpack it. I think at this point. Yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. ideology is kind of my private obsession. Um, okay. And I've been trying to figure out what the fuck it is and why everyone has one and. I've been trying to figure out if it's possible to not have one because that's what I personally am striving for is to not have one. But like to be not just agnostic, but to not even waste time. Like, is that what you mean? Or do you mean more of to like observe and interact with zero sense of judgment and like personal response? Is that more what you mean? Closer to the second one, but I think it's like something like to always be making an actively individual responsible decision or something. Mm. So like you're talking about not trying you're well, so this is a little bit of a problem. Mm. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like what you're saying is that I so distrust uh, any external ideas that have been created by people in power or communities or cultures or religions that I want to make sure I am not absorbing or responding to any of them and to only be like only have opinions as myself and not be influenced by others. That's that like pretty, saying? that's pretty close. Yeah. That's definitely the, that's the seed of it. And I see problems with that because I'm, I really believe in like ancient wisdom i believe in like cultivated wisdom over the generations and stuff so i see the danger in denying myself i have been denying myself those wisdoms for like quite a long time mm. and I'm, I'm just now starting to learn how to not do that uh that was at the expense of myself you know so yeah it is it's 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 the problem of trying to figure out whether like what the what the individual is and what the collective is and where I'm supposed to like exist in those two things. Well, that is the question of life. Mm -hmm. And I remember growing up, I was raised Christian and I remember always hearing like, well, I just look at the earth and that's what tells me that I should believe in God. Mm -hmm. You know, like the planet is proof of God. And I have left practicing Christianity and I don't know how to self identify. I don't think that identifying any in any way is like helpful to me or people that I know. Um, I feel like I have a healthy sense of questioning about if there is a higher power and sort of like how we describe God. And what's really surprised me about the last three years of throwing myself into like science, being more connected to the earth, growing more, gardening more, studying how living organisms interact, learning about fungus, learning about microbiology, learning about chemistry. Um, I think the less I believe in God. Mm. And what I mean by that is, and allow me to talk about masculinity for a moment, I think that the concept of having a singular higher power that has influence and control and is omniscient and omnipotent is like a very masculine concept, at least the way that our culture defi like defines masculine. Um, and when I study how like things that are living in the physical world act and behave and live and die, there's none of that. Like, Everything is connected and requires something else, millions of other things to live, to make decisions, to survive, to reproduce, to eat. Um, and I just, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that perspective, but the idea of me being an important person or the idea of me knowing who I am or the idea of me thinking about a singular God and what is my individual relationship with that higher power seems really insignificant. Mm. The more time I spend outside. So maybe you should garden. 
Well. It will help you process your thoughts. <laughs> I tell you, I've done a lot of processing <laughs> over the last few it's years. I, I've done a lot of godlessness over the last few years. Yeah. Um, I went from Christianity to like hardcore um, other stuff. And I wouldn't say I'm back to... I'm I'm mapping out the world again, I think, and learning why certain things seem to work better for certain people who are able to maintain maybe a romance and a faith in life. Yes. And I think that that doesn't depend on a theistic God or whatever. I don't think it's like, like our, you know, whatever the thing that we were like, that a lot of us were raised with this, yeah. like really intense picture of what God was supposed to be. Yeah. I think, um, there's a lot of ancient wisdom that got like, there's a lot of ancient wisdom that points to this idea of, uh, the highest possible good that one can imagine. And that mm -hmm. to be dedicated to it, to be committed to it, it makes a really big difference. Um, I do think that there's a really do, like noticeable impact on somebody who lives that way and feels that sense of responsibility to stay good. Yes. Then it, rather than the person who just wants to indulge in like the whatever the, the absolute worst parts of their imagination you know and i guess what i'm saying is that i now define good less from a perspective of morality good and bad good and mm, evil yeah. like the absence of sin i think good is more about just that you're creating more than you're destroying mm. you're connecting more than you're separating you're enjoying more than you're stifling. You're, you know, this like positive force that I think when you study Eastern religions, you see a lot more in like the feminine powers and the feminine gods. And that's very interesting to me that, well, I don't, I'm about to talk about aphids and I, uh, it's just so hard to talk about these concepts because humans, we live in, we're such like a microscopic percentage of the earth. Like we even talk about reproduction as if it's like a male and female thing and plenty of things reproduce asexually. And so it's like I mix all of this science into my head when I try to think about like what's going on in culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I think just being good is more about creating. And that's a, been a, like a healthier way for me. Yeah, I get that. To think about like morality and purpose and my responsibility that yeah. I have. There's a, a discipline that, um, yeah, like, pra like people use the word pragmatism, you know, to as yeah. a kind of a synonym for realistic or something. But yeah, I, I'm fascinated by like the more, um, I don't know, the origins of pragmatism as a belief of like. I think foundationally that that which brings about life is correct or that, that, that truth mm. is defined by what brings about life. Mm. And it sounds a little bit like there's some overlap there with what you're talking about. Like yeah. the overall the product and the life that brings about like prosperity or that brings about like longevity and, and things of that sort rather than demise. Yes. I went down a rabbit hole last night. Um, just you know everyone talks about our founding fathers right now which people should stop talking about them but um i thought it was interesting that the original version of uh the constitution said you know life liberty and property and then it got rewritten to say life liberty and the pursuit of happiness hmm. and i had some cynicism that was like well isn't that interesting <laughs> That in that moment they realized like, oh, well, you know, we have a whole country here and we have, you know, the like we have women that can't own property. We have slaves that can't own property. So maybe we shouldn't put property in here and maybe we'll just do happiness, you know, because that's a very like fake idea. Um, and then I was reading about kind of how that transition happened and he was studying a lot of Locke's work and it's a lot of philosophy around like what is the true meaning of happiness like what's the real definition of happiness and happiness used to be a very meaningful word that was grounded in like 
your productivity and meaning that comes from like investing in something real and concrete that like brings purpose and joy to people around you. Mm. And that's, that was this idea, like life, liberty, and that. And that is even more stark when you look at where the country is today, I think. So few people feel that in mm -hmm. their day-to-day -day life. So For few sure. people have the resources and the community and the support and the religious idea, like all of this to to actually be doing this thing of purpose and value that brings them like great happiness and joy. Like yeah. homesteading. Yeah. It's ha well, is like true happiness, I think. <laughs> I, I really do too. I really do too. Um, yeah. I, so I want to ask you this, like what you, you meant, like you, I don't, I don't know what you're, you and I don't know each other like really at all. We're just learning about each other and I don't know your beliefs. Um, you the, like, I don't know. I was curious about your, like what you just said about the founding fathers or whatever. And given that we're talking about masculinity and femininity and stuff, I think, <laughs> I think it's like, I think what I'm curious about is just like, I think what it comes down to is like, whether we're talking about, I think I'm curious whether we have a similar vision for like what the outcome, what an ideal balance looks like. What do you mean? Between these two, uh, what between these two hypothetical powers or hypothetical energies that that affect the world? I think the question is like, mm. I think my idea is when I think about the when I think about a happy relationship, when I think about a happy uh, society, I think about yeah. an equal balance of usefulness between masculinity and femininity. I have no negative feelings about masculinity. I think it's like super important. And I think it's like, um, I think the useful side of masculinity needs to be remembered by yeah. men right now and yeah. young men in particular. Uh, and I, so I was just wondering, I guess what you thought about that. And if it was like, if, if, if that made sense to you or if you had a different vision. Totally. I think it's really, I think what's so hard for me to talk about is because the concept of masculinity and femininity is so attached to gender, which is like very confusing, mm -hmm. right? We have this idea that a human being is like a male human being. Like if you're born assigned male at birth, you're like seven, your body is like someone poured in like 70% masculinity. And then like 30% feminine or like, you know, if you're talking to very particular people, it's 99% masculinity <laughs> and 1% don't ask. Um, and I, I like, I just, do we work that way? Like, I don't think we work that way. Um, so, you know, you can talk about gender and having equality in society and inside of the capitalist environment and having, you know, egalitarian relationships, all of those things I believe in are really good and necessary and important. Um, but like you are probably equal parts masculine and feminine, feminine, as am I. I don't, Maybe it's just my scientific brain really struggles. Like I'm a math and science person. Mm -hmm. And so in my brain, it's like, what percentage? <laughs> it's always my brain's question. Interesting. Like what, huh. like, because when you define it and then you start defining, to me, it's like an arrangement. Like what percent feminine should I be? That's fascinating. Do you not think about it that way? No. How, how do you think about it? I still have a lot of curiosity about it, but I think of it in terms of psychology and again, okay. in terms of story. Like, I think that is like my default. I was having a conversation with one of my good friends this week about shit that's going on. And, and she's, she was like in med school. She's super mechanical and like how she sees everything. Yeah. Um, I don't think most people I know aren't that way. Mm. Most people I talk to, it's a, there's a drama that's unfolding in people's minds and that they're a part of that. And that's, 
Oh, interesting. It's also what I experience. Like I yeah. feel as though I live a drama that I'm a part of. <laughs> uh, and so anyway, for me, it's not even a singular thing. It's not a finished product of like, okay, I'm, I'm this, like, uh, it's, there are times where it's appropriate for me to be in a, in my personal, like feminine capabilities. And there's times where it's appropriate for me to be in my masculine ones. Like when I go to work and have to be a certain way, that's often at a time where I feel like my masculine traits are called upon as, as compared to when I'm like yeah. being a poet performer type person. Yeah. Like that's a whole different it, there's masculinity probably to that, but I think there's there's also something else there. There's a well, that's so that's this is really interesting to me, and I should say masculinity and femininity were like m- huge issues in my house growing up. Mm. Like it was common for this to be discussed, mm. and it was weaponized in my home very early. But it's before we talk about that, it's interesting to hear you describe that as like when you feel like your masculine self. Because when it's 100 degrees outside and I'm in work boots with a shovel and I've been like hauling ass for seven hours and I think I'm going to die, but like I'm working so hard, like I have these fleeting moments of feeling like so proud of myself and that's when I feel like feminine strength. Mm, I love that. Like I don't, I don't, uh, yeah, like I my brain's like fuck yeah women it probably and like in a good way probably yeah. where you feel like you're like fuck yeah like i'm a man yeah and like i don't think anyone should be ashamed of that like you know we there's so many jokes now i've even heard my words and i was like oh that's normal i think what you're feeling is like yourself and so that's right yeah yeah and so that's that's where i'm like why do we bother putting labels on things because maybe just what you're feeling is like your whole self. Well, yeah, I think that's that's really true. Like that le- that power, that self assuredness, I think yeah. is like a that's a that's otherwise adulthood, you know. And it, mm-hmm. that is for men and women both, you know. That's there's nothing. It doesn't matter to me if somebody if it makes somebody feel like a man or a woman to sweat and finish a job. Fuck yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah, and for me, I don't know what. Tri- but yeah, that's my adulthood I guess I don't know (laughs) but uh do you have any memories of these things these ideas being talked about when you were a kid no I wouldn't say talked about um I do or like alluded to there were different ways for me I don't know what you I don't know how it was like imposed on you these ideas Mm -hmm. but for me uh like I mean like I couldn't stand like Uh, they, like I went to a Christian school where they made me start shaving and I always had to have my hair cut real short and shit. And like for like 10 years after I graduated, I just, my hair, I refused to, uh, my project at the time was like to deny myself vanity and to just look like a fucking woods person. So it's a very like masculine idea in a lot of conservative Christian environments. Huh? Interesting. Yeah, I thought of it the other way around, I guess. But that was because, I mean, I'm just thinking of it in superficial terms of, like, men have short hair and men yeah. look this way because in the 40s we started looking this way or whatever. I was just like, fuck that. So, I, I don't know. I felt like leaning into, like, my hippie woods nature side was, like, a, oh, I a see what feminine you're saying. thing for me. I see what you're saying, yes. So, what I meant was, so, I'm the oldest of four kids. So, there's me, my sister, and then two brothers. And my brothers, um, I should also say, I grew up in a very, like, musical and artistic home. Hmm. And uh, both of my brothers are musicians, one of them full-time. And there was so much uh, control and leverage. Like, there was so much control being leveraged over us in our appearance and how we behaved through the lens of what was masculine and what was feminine. And so if my brother wanted to grow his hair out, he, you know, my dad would say like, hey, you're gay. Like he would, you know, really belittle him and make fun of him and say really emasculating things. Mm. And it was usually like, you shouldn't care about how you look. Like that's such a gay thing to do or that's a girly thing to do. Um, 
and and then that was like compounded with the religious connotation of like and probably just culturally of the time like men have short hair and women have long hair you know I wasn't allowed to cut my hair when I was growing up I had to have really long hair um that's because women should have really long hair there that's whatever the I forget the verse about it but um I just, I remember it being very burned into me that to care was for women and to not care was for men. Yeah. And then the real trick was that you were supposed to really care as a woman, but like at some point you would cross the line of vanity and you would become the woman that is like written about in the Bible where you're either Jezebel or, you know, like there's a line like you're allowed you have to care not even a lot you have to care but like at some point it's too much Hmm. um and so i don't know i just remember you know so my brothers had very similar experiences like as soon as they were out of the house they both grew their hair out super long yeah and who knows for what reason it's probably just because that's what they felt like was themselves and that was cool that was me yeah that's just they felt super comfortable that way um, and then I think it was also because we internalize things as kids. It's like, Hey, you know, at some point it becomes like, you're right. Men shouldn't give a shit about how they, how they look. And I think a lot of guys pick that up and carry it and probably don't know that they're carrying it mm-hmm. because how many times they got bullied or it was commented like, that's a girl thing. Yeah. Or why are you not being like this hyper masculine guy? Definitely. Just get a buzz cut and get over it. Yeah. Like, you know. I do remember. You know, I mean, I don't think I, because I didn't, I don't feel the impact of this, and I'm like perfectly fine. I don't, I don't care about these words very much, and if somebody says I don't seem masculine or seem feminine enough or something, <laughs> it just doesn't affect me very much. Yeah. But I do remember in school that there was at least a language we used to describe some of that. And like in the school I happened to go to, it was, it really came down a lot to like brands. This is embarrassing to even acknowledge, but like, if like people wore, uh, if people wore Abercrombie, Mm -hmm. we thought that that was definitely more effeminate of them than it was to wear other brands that were probably owned by the same fucking companies. Yeah. That's because Abercrombie was, owned by an openly gay man and everyone who worked for him was openly gay. Well, we didn't know that. And, and we <laughs> I didn't, didn't know, that. know that. And I watched this, I watched the Abercrombie documentary about this and it was fascinating and you, it's worth watching because it was such a, like to study Abercrombie and Victoria's Secret and what was going on with like Les Wexner and like these men that were controlling retail during the nineties fascinating because Hmm. that was like our childhood yeah and so much of like these cultural forces that sort of resulted in like the britney spears and backstreet boys like being like the music of our time it's uh and i never knew exactly why parents and then you know through us we were like anti abercrombie slash it was also like effeminate because it certainly their clothes were not right you know, there's nothing about a polo shirt and khakis that are like, <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, it's very interesting to watch. Yeah, yeah. So somehow someone was picking up on that, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. That's the moral to that story. Wacky. But yeah. Do you fuck with Carl Jung at all? I don't read that much psychology and philosophy things. I've just been anyway. trying to wrap my head around this idea and I don't know it yet. I, I can't, I don't know it well enough to express, but I can at least share it with you. And if yeah. you are curious about it, you can look into it, yeah. but I can't remember what, what the terms are anima and animus. And I don't remember who they applied to, but anyway, I think his theory was that like every, his theory was, and I don't know, I don't know psychologically like how this is affected by, anatomy how it would be affected by anatomy Mm -hmm. but he seemed to think that like all men had you know like their their 
their actual ego, their actual persona and all this stuff. And they also had like their undiscovered feminine that was a part of their psychology or their psyche. Okay. And he believed that women too had their like undiscovered masculine that was a part of their psyche. And that like part of our journey as individuals was that if we, if we kind of didn't figure it out, if we Mm. didn't have a proper relationship with our other half or whatever, Mm. that it would express itself in unhealthy ways in our lives or whatever. So for example, guys who take on negative feminine traits, hypothetically, according to him would, would not have a, they wouldn't have the proper relationship with their positive feminine traits. That is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Uh, Hmm. a lot of people really feel like Jung, even Freud are just like unimportant and not like, their shit isn't relevant or whatever and i don't know why but jung is weird and has some weird shit yeah. that is worth reading about well i mean all of that stuff is like really beneficial and valuable from its time and it's you know humans are but we build things over generations and we're building our understanding of psychology over generations and so like I totally believe that these men laid foundational building blocks and that also some of them are incorrect and like parts of them, you know? Yeah. So I, I hear a lot of how problematic they are, but it doesn't mean that everything they did was wrong or everything that they hypothesized was problematic. Yeah. We lose a lot Um, if we think that. Yes. So it's, it's, I think it's all worth studying. Yeah. I will Google about this. Okay, cool. (laughs) I will, I'll send you something too. Okay. (laughs) So, Maybe we should talk more about gardening. <laughs> Let's do it. What, um, what are just like your favorite things to grow? What if you're like telling, getting people into gardening and kind of expose them to new things other than just like tomatoes and sunflowers? Ooh. What are you going to tell them about? Um, I think the easiest thing to do is actually to stick with what you enjoy growing, but to learn new varieties of it. Mm. Um, because the grocery store is so lame, like. I, it's really funny to me how, so I had a terrible relationship with food, uh, growing up. I'm actually going to, I'm going to give you the most colossal long answer to this question, if that's okay. Hell yeah. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I'm here for. Okay. (laughs) So, um, I grew up, my family had extremely little money, like, and sometimes it was more, sometimes it was less. And when I was like eight or nine years old, I think it was like at the absolute worst. And we lived in Birmingham, Alabama. We were going to food banks for like for food. My mom had just gotten pregnant with the fourth um, baby, my brother, John. And we moved a lot. So the house that I live in now, I'm 34 years old and this is my 27th place I've lived in. Jesus Christ. Yeah. That is a lot. It's a lot. So... I, you know, every year, sometimes more than that, I was in a different place and I was never in school either. So when people like, I have no concept of how old someone is in fourth grade, like this zero idea. Um, I just remember my childhood by like backyards that I was in or not in when we were in apartments. And it's interesting to me that the worst year I think of my family's like financial life was my best year because of the house that we were in in Birmingham had this amazing garden in the backyard and we didn't grow a ton I don't think like I remember green beans squash we had a strawberry patch Um, but I remember you know and my mom is weirdly like a pretty good cook but our food was just really bad because the like what she was buying like we just had no money and even when we did she was extraordinarily frugal and all of us kind of grew up during this timeline where food like mass distribution and mass farming and like monocropping was kind of like reaching its height and so food has become the most affordable than it's ever been and we were eating kind of the worst food that any person on the planet has ever eaten Mm. like whatever vegetable you can imagine we were eating as kids the all-time grossest version of that vegetable Hmm. which is important to know that's why we all hated vegetables as kids interesting truly disgusting vegetables (laughs) like we were correct they were objectively (laughs) bad um and parents are like but my god how do i get my child to eat this despicable brussels sprout um and so you know like i just grew up with like really bad food and we have this continuing joke like max will not eat stale meat 
So, you know, even my talk to my mom a couple of months ago and she was telling me about these fillet, uh, I don't know, sirloin tips that she had gotten. And she was like, they were on clearance and they were amazing. And Max is just like, oh yeah, good old sale meat <laughs> from Kroger. Um, anyway, so we were eating really cheap food and we were eating the cheap food that was on sale. And so nothing had any flavor. And also there are in general somewhere between 50 and like, 20,000 varieties of every vegetable that you know. So there are tens of thousands of varieties of tomatoes. Mm. There are, I, man, I'm not, I'm going to misquote this. I, I just want also tens of thousands of varieties of beans. So the amount of food that's on earth is like the variety and the diversity diversity is staggering. And we just don't know because we've only ever been exposed to what's in the grocery store. And it's, all, all the seeds in the world are controlled by like four companies worldwide. Mm. And that's what our farms are buying seeds from them. And so like the diversity is shrinking at a rapid rate because people are not saving their own seeds. And so, you know, you do what businesses do. Like you select all the way down to the thing that's going to give you the most output, that's going to make you the most amount of money, that's going to have the least amount of problems, you're going to get the least amount of complaints from farmers because you, some disease wiped out their crop. So we're, we, like the selection at the grocery store is so laughably bad that when people say to me, I want to grow you know, the heirloom tomato, bless their heart, they actually think that's a kind of tomato. But that's because when you go to the grocery store, there's the red tomato, the cherry tomato, and then like the one that looks cool, and that's the heirloom tomato. Heirloom is like a category. It just means that the seeds have been around for like 100 years, and they haven't been like altered, and they are usually like native to the area, and so they can grow a lot better. And there are like tens of thousands of types of heirloom tomatoes. And like that's not your fault or anyone else's fault that we don't know that. That's just mass distribution is so bad that we don't even know like what vegetables are mm. and so when people say like oh i want to grow a cabbage can i do that the answer is like you can grow everything just make sure you get a good variety mm. and so there's a learning curve but to me that's like the thing that i enjoy the most is finding the interesting variety and like and is that that's usually very personal I mean, it can be, but like we all have limited time. So sometimes it's, there's a lot of different ways to find cool varieties. So like my favorite thing to do in the middle of the winter is just get seed catalogs and like look online and you just discover things. And mm -hmm. if something looks cool to you, like that's the seed packet you order. Another great way to do it is like your local farmer's market or greenhouse they usually are going to be growing the heirloom, like the heirloom varieties that are native to your region because that's the best thing they can do to ensure that your tomato plant is actually going to live hmm. and that they're not going to get a complaint that like all my stuff that I bought from you died. Yeah. So that's a great way to discover really cool varieties. Um, and then like, man, their Facebook groups are really interesting. Like social media is dying and Facebook groups are thriving. <laughs> <laughs> groups are saying this is where my old advertising life comes in like groups are single-handedly keeping like facebook in business interesting yeah and so like the amount of information and like knowledge sharing that's still happening among farming and like farmers homesteaders home gardeners on a facebook group is i need to get in on that i think it's like i mean it's i cannot speak more highly of it hmm. it's so great well, so that sounds pretty cool. I mean, that's like, uh, I think you just explained what I sometimes experience, like when I go to a farmer's market or something, kind yeah. of see somebody of mine or see somebody doing something I didn't know of. Yeah. And there's these, there's just like, I mean, a, a friend of mine introduced me to like black watermelon at some point. And they're like Super cool. little ones that are way yeah. more, and like, I thought it like the, the texture and the flavor I thought was way better than any watermelon I'd ever had. I'm sure. And I was like... Yeah, they, just that experience uh, when he introduced me to that. I was just like, no, watermelons are this thing. They're shaped like that. We have the, the emoji. We know what they look <laughs> yeah, like. That's a watermelon. <laughs> and I was like, shit, uh, there's more than there's more than that. That's God, good to so know. <laughs> it's so many. I remember when I first started gardening again as an adult, 
and I was reading all this research also because I was in marketing about gardening and how like the most interesting thing to gardeners was like finding new varieties to grow. And I just, I had this thought like, what a dumb thing to like waste your time <laughs> on. <laughs> and here I am all of like two years later. Yeah. Are you glad that you got the, you got the bug? Oh, I just, I feel like I'm living. Let's go back to this idea of homesteading, living. Yes. That producing happiness. Like, why do you think that is? There's so many components to it that, like, you can find your, like, no matter who you are as a person, no matter your personality, no matter how your brain works, like, you will find yourself there. I mean... I am one of those annoying people that wishes I could be in college forever. Mm. If someone was like, hey, Lauren, we're going to just pay your rent and you're going to be in college for the next 50 years. I'd be like, wow, I have died and gone to heaven. <laughs> this is great. Um, and I think homes like homesteading farming is that for me because almost every other day there's like this. I'm like, what is happening? And then I have to research it. Mm. And so every single day I'm in a position where, again, context, like I have a real problem to solve and I can go as deep or as shallow as I want. Yeah. Sometimes I just need somebody that's like, hey, go to the store and buy magnesium sulfate and like put a teaspoon on it. And then other days it's like, well, I'm going to study the difference between a silica clay particle <laughs> and the amount of like, you know, nitrogen that will attach to it because whatever chemical has a is like a stronger connection or electrical Holy charge shit. than something else and i'm like you don't have to do that but like what whatever it is that you gravitate towards mm -hmm. it sounds like you're saying like for most people like in that space of interacting with the world in yeah. such a direct way that whatever it is that your nature wants out of life that it can it can kind of be found in this yeah part of life it's just like a playground yeah it just feels like playing i remember me. when <laughs> that game came out like three years ago or however long uh where people like make a little avatar of themselves and they run around planting flowers oh animal crossing crossing <laughs> animal. i remember when that game came out i was like this is a game about people wishing this game exists because people want to be out there like planting gardens and looking around at trees and looking yeah. at bugs and catching fish and taking pride in their house. Yeah. What and why are we doing it in a game? Why aren't we? I'm, I was like, I kept making a joke at the time. Like, I just want my real life to be like Animal Crossing or whatever, yeah. um, which didn't really land with people because it. <laughs> Because <laughs> it was, I don't know, not funny. But um, well, I'll give you like a non cynical take on that, which is I think everyone wants to be doing that, but people want to do it socially. Mm. And there is an issue with like loneliness. Yeah. And gardening and homesteading. And I wouldn't say that like I feel lonely or that I feel alone when I'm doing it, but it is not usually a social act. And so to be able to have like a very large group of people that you both know and do not know participating in this thing that you all find very interesting and, and rewarding, I think that's why these maybe games, maybe I'm just trying to be more positive. I think that's great. Uh, there's always room <laughs> to look for positivity. It depends though. Like, um, for me so far, this little garden here has been a, a, a reason for me to learn more from people about gardening. Yeah. Um, you know, for my cousin up somewhere doing his homestead thing, really doing it like, well, uh, you know, his, I saw his wife at a wedding recently and, or I saw them at a wedding and his wife was telling me like, yeah, this, this lady that lives next door to us, I was like, can I put a garden in over here? It might touch mm -hmm. your land or whatever. And she was like, I'll be out there tomorrow. We'll teach you how to do everything. And she was like, amazing. Oh, cool. And they have, my cousin has like five kids now. So wow. like, it's a, it's a way their their family exists too. You know, it's like, there's, there's yeah. some social room there. I think it can be social, but obviously oh, 100%. for me right yes. now, it would not be very much, but, but you're right. You're right. It, it, I think a lot of people who 
don't really give a shit about having a super busy social life. They might go to gardening specifically for that reason. Yes. You have to spend such an ungodly amount of time with other people when you work in advertising Mm. that I think it took like 20 years off my life. (laughs) Yeah. Like I was probably meant to live until I was like 98. If Mm. I study like the women of my family line, I'm going to clock out at 70 because of advertising. Mm. Um, Yes, it is not good to be in like nine hours of meetings every day. No. And people really spending time alone outside is amazing. Yeah. And when you like using your whole body, like when you said that it made sense to me immediately and I immediately pictured a deer and how I can't Mm -hmm. picture a deer with like a pulled muscle. I can't picture a deer being like, (laughs) (laughs) unless it like had a really good reason. I can't picture one being like, Oh, I haven't been using my leg enough, you know? Oh, yes. Yes. We are the only people that like try to do the thing that our body was not meant to do. Yeah. Everyone else just like lives, goes on its their way. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. Um, I do think that more people should try to grow. And I think that people should not be afraid of failing because... I feel like we attach so much of our personal selves to what we grow and we feel like it's all our influence or lack of influence. And a lot of times it's not. Um, but then the next thing to talk about is dirt. But I don't know if you want to talk about dirt. I sure do. Dirt. Tell me about it. Well, let's do this. What questions do you have? Because you're like, you're wanting to do what so many people want to do. So I think for me... Uh, If I could imagine running into issues, it would be like a friend of mine said, you know, a friend of mine said she was trying to get a garden going and uh, didn't like had no idea that her dirt was not sufficient for what she was trying to grow. Mm. I think the first question might be if somebody isn't scientifically minded and doesn't really know how to go about experimenting with learning about acid, uh, like acidity or whatever, different levels of chemicals or, or whatever, however their soil, whatever condition their soil might be in. Yeah. How would somebody, a layman like start to, to learn that? Wow. What a great question. Uh, you know, I don't think that there are great answers. Uh, YouTube probably is Mm. my, or like, come take one of my classes (laughs) or read my newsletter. No, I, I feel so like passionately that this should be just like common knowledge for us that we all just kind of like missed out on as a generation. So I'll talk a little bit about it Mm -hmm. if you want to know. I do. Um, So soil, I kind of think about like what is happening in the world of soil in three buckets. Soil has like three parts to it. One part is usually the part we talk about, which is like the physical, like the physicality of it, like the physical makeup which is, is this clay soil? Is this sandy soil? Is this silty soil? Like you can look at it, you can put your hands in it and you can kind of know, most people have a working sense of like, this is amazing dirt. Like when they pour potting soil out of the back or like, wow, this dirt sucks. Yeah. When they're like out in a desert kicking around stuff. (laughs) Um, Like we have an instinctual spectrum that we're in. Yeah. So that's like the physical piece of it. And I can talk a little bit about that here for like when you're starting this. Sure. The second part is chemistry, which chemistry got a really bad rap when we were high school. I avoided chemistry at all costs. I did all of the science and maths except for chemistry. And I wish that I had done, I had done it because I think it's really cool now. Um, It's just like basically the study of molecules and like what makes up the stuff Mm. that exists. And in the world of gardening, It's nutrients. So chemistry is like you take vitamin D because you are told that makes you feel better. Why? I don't know. You take it. It's just the chemistry in your body. So the chemistry of the soil are things like when you pick up a bag of fertilizer and there's NPK on everything, that's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Mm. Those are nutrients. And the reason they're important is because they facilitate like chemical reactions in the soil. And you probably heard about pH balance, which Mm. like we have, the dirt has. It exists like on an acidic to alkaline spectrum. And 
it can really like feel overwhelming initially to learn about this stuff. Yeah. And you just like, you just got to go with it. Like when you read something or you watch a video, you just got to tell yourself, I'm going to remember 10% of it and 10% is enough. Cause I'm going to be doing this long enough to come across this information 10 times. And like, I will eventually know, like it will become common knowledge to me. So acidity is interesting because um, it basically is controlling how much can or cannot like attach, how many nutrients can or cannot attach to like the dirt, or it's going to control what kind of chemical reactions can or can't happen in the soil. Mm. And so you could have like a lot of great nutrition in your dirt, but if the pH balance is off, uh, the nutrients might like leach right out of the soil or they might not be able to travel up and down the plant. So like chemistry is crazy, but it's pretty easy to learn like to put down nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Cause that, those are like your three things that are in every general all purpose, like bag of fertilizer. So that's the second part. So you got the physical part, which is like, how does it feel? The chemical part, which is like the nutrients that are in it. Right. And then the third part that no one knows about that is the coolest part is the biology. So a teaspoon of soil has, I think it's over like 10 billion living organisms in it. We are more like bacteria and fungus than we are anything else. And the microbiology, so like the dirt is basically the stomach of like the world. And here's what I mean. When you like swallow a vitamin, your body cannot absorb that. When you like eat a carrot and you're like, wow, I'm eating this super nutritious thing, your, your body cannot do anything with that. Um, you have billions of tiny living creatures in your stomach, which is kind of gross. <laughs> they eat it. They eat it. And then they poop it out and they turn it into an accessible nutrient that then your body can absorb. Hmm. So most living things have to have something smaller eat something and digest it first in order for them to access it. So like when I learned this, I felt like multiple light bulbs went off and maybe it's femininity, maybe it's because I'm a woman but my brain switched from like, oh, I don't need to do the math of chemistry and like the order of things. There's not like a formula for good dirt and for gardening. I just need to care and nurture these billions of invisible things that live in the dirt that are like performing all of the services for me and my plants Interesting. and my health. That's also why our health in America sucks because we're growing plants in the absence of these microbes, which means when we're eating plants, we're not getting like replenished microbes in our stomach. So we have like all time lows, bacteria, funguses in our body, or things are getting out of balance. And a lot of times we are eating enough nutrients. It's just that like our body doesn't have the right stuff to digest it and absorb it for us. So I love to talk about the microbiology of the soil because that's the one, and when you hear things about like permaculture or regenerative farming, most of what they're doing is just like trying to care for and help all of those microbes and funguses and nematodes and arthropods like reproduce. That is uh, wild to think it's about wild. in those terms. Like I've heard, I, I've heard ideas like that before, but for some reason the way you just explained it just was different and mm. just made more sense, particularly the part about my own body and like what that is and, yeah. and how that works. And, uh, fascinating, fascinating to like contextualize it through that lens and that, that it had a different impact on you to learn about it, looking at it that way. Yeah. So, I mean, when you plant something and then, so here's also what's wild. Um, are you are you very familiar with like uh let's just talk with like what is dirt so dirt is uh mineral and organic matter like those two things so the minerals are just like broken down rock and 90 like your dirt out there is 99 percent mineral it's basically just broken down bits of rock or like other minerals that were created as a chemical reaction 
And then the organic matter is anything that is decomposed from something that was alive at one time. Mm. So dead bodies, trees, leaves, dead animals, dead plants. And you want like as much organic matter in your soil as possible because that is a big food source for like all of the biology in the dirt and for like a whole bunch of other reasons. But the thing that's crazy to me is that these nutrients and like chemical compounds that are good for the plants and that they require to like live and photosynthesize, minerals have like all of those nutrients, like the rock particles have it. So technically, if you have really, if you're taking care of your dirt, you should never need to fertilize or feed anything. Mm. Because the minerals should be broken down and should be eaten and digested by all these microbes at a rate that is fast enough to then produce food for your plant. And is this true in like like the more clayey type yes. dirt too? Clay is the most nutrient dense soil of any soil. Really? Yes. Huh. Clay is also very interesting. So, uh, so a big, a huge problem that's happening with home gardeners and farming is that because we have these really bad practices that are killing all of the microbiology in the soil, the dirt can't like, can't give of the nutrients that it's possessing with the minerals. So we have to add things like fertilizers. And when we're using synthetic fertilizers, Synthetic fertilizers usually kill fungus and bacteria and microbiology that's in the soil. So like you just, every time you apply a non-organic fertilizer, you just make the problem worse. So fertilizer is not bad. Fertilizer is great and you should use it for the first couple of years of like farming, homesteading, but just make sure it's always organic or that it's like a natural der derivative of like bone meal or whatever. Um, so we now have created this environment where like we have to produce such an unbelievable amount of fertilizer to sustain everything that's living that like when farmers and climate change scientists talk about the point of no return like that's a really big part of like what's happening with our topsoil and regenerative agriculture is like trying to put all of that back into the dirt mm -hmm. um anyways clay is really interesting because the particle of a clay a particle of clay is the size of a particle of tobacco smoke. It's so small that it is invisible. Like that's how tiny it is. Hmm. And that's why it's so compact because it's so tiny. You can shove them together so tightly that there's basically very few or no pores between them and the pores are how the roots travel and like how the root travels. Now, clay holds on to everything because of how tight it is. And like, this is where you get into math again, like the smaller something is, the more surface area it will have like collectively. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's kind of the idea that like a, a bunch of marbles have more surface area than like the surface area of a basketball. Huh, if you yeah. measure what's around a basketball, it's less than like all the little marbles in that same basketball shape. Uh -huh. So because surface area is like what clings to water, clings to nutrients, clings to microbes. That's why clay is so amazing. It can hold so much stuff. So that's why clay is actually super helpful for living in these really hot, dry climates because it holds on to water hmm. more than other, like than sand, which is, just runs Damn. through it. So clay is great, but most of us just really need to work on adding biology back into the soil because most of it's been lost. If you're living in a new development, like if your home was built in the last 30 years, you can pretty much guarantee that you have just dead dirt, like everything's been demolished. Um, and you probably have a lot of other like toxins and stuff in it from construction. So like you want to do things that add that living stuff in it. And then you want to do things that improve like the structure of that soil and that's just add as much like organic matter as you can so here's a question yeah oh for somebody who might live in winston might live in a house uh, whatever yeah somebody who's who might be wanting to get this stuff rolling yeah. even if they 
well, no, let's let's not worry about somebody who lives in an apartment. But say say somebody's given the option between like, okay, I have a shitty yard that is that all the dirt is bad. Yeah, is it better for me to like take on the whole yard as a project or just do like a little raised bed and start with like a smaller space to produce food? Mm. Like, what's more important to 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 go big or go productive? That's an amazing question. So in-ground gardening here is amazing because of the clay. We have so many nutrients in the dirt that if you can like get it, if you can get the structure and the texture right and the biology right, like your in-ground beds will probably end up being more productive in the long run than a raised bed. However, it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So I think my best advice is plan for the short term and for the long term and be like very reasonable about what to expect for both. So you should definitely do a couple of raised beds because you can bring in really high quality dirt and you can basically guarantee that like what you grow for the first year is going to be great. But then like try to acquire as much organic matter as you can. So there's this amazing company called Chip Drop and it basically, you just give them your address and anytime an arborist or tree company has to go like take down a tree or remove a tree that's fallen, instead of taking those wood trips to a landfill, they'll come drop it off at your house and it's free. Nice. And so it's keeping all these trees out of the landfill, which is a silly place for anyone to take a tree. Yeah. And it's bringing them to your property and that will decompose like over the course of the year. And that's adding a ton of carbon and nitrogen and mycorrhizal fungi to your property that you really want. So it can be really difficult to do that if you're on a really small property and you don't have a place to put like a massive pile of wood chips. Like you have an amazing place for that. And I would say go ahead and get like as many of those as they will bring to you and just let them sit because you might not use them for three years, but that might be how long it takes that much to like decompose. And then that's just producing, you know, more organic matter to sit on top of your dirt. And obviously you don't want to wait that long to grow something. So while you're waiting and while you're like cover cropping to add more nitrogen back into the soil, you can do a raised bed. Yeah. That makes a lot of good sense. Yeah. I actually am, I'm like really desperately want to get uh, like a small wood chipper here so I can just like produce my own. That would be amazing because you have so many trees. Yeah. And like a lot of them, I've got like three brush piles right now that I just don't need. Yeah. I'd be fine with having one, but, uh, Chip it. Yeah, I'd like to just throw them in a chipper and have mulch. You know, I so. find one on Craigslist. Tell me more about what you're doing with the classes and what people should know, because I think mm. I know people that would absolutely love to to know what you're doing and like get them like like learn from it. Yeah. So, where are you doing classes? What what is what can people do? So I do a lot of classes in the like winter, kind of like winter, spring, and fall. I've had to stop doing them in the summer because there's so much work to do outside and because I'm helping people put in a lot of gardens right now. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I partner with Jessica Blackstock who runs the Backyard Book Club, which is a really great thing to follow on Instagram. She is connecting a lot of people in the city now who want to learn how to farmstead. And so uh, she'll she'll just invite people to do wood shops that are like how to grow mushrooms, how to compost, how to start this thing from seed, how to like get chickens and what to know the first year of having chickens. And so I'll teach classes um, like with her. And so that's a really great way to do it. I would say the best thing to do is follow me on Instagram, which is Floricult Gardens and subscribe to my newsletter. So you can just go to floricult.com. And I usually send out an email on Fridays. And if I ever teach, I'm trying to do a good mix of like in-person classes on Winston and then also virtual classes for anyone that is wherever or just can't make it and that's how I'll kind of tell people about when those classes are so I'll probably pick up a lot more in the fall um, although I really want to do one this summer because fall's actually the best season to grow here mm. I'm gonna talk about that we all grew up thinking that gardening was a summer thing right and there's actually plants are divided into three categories We have cool season vegetables, warm season vegetables, 
and cold season vegetables. So in North Carolina and a lot of other zones, you can actually grow cool seasons in the spring and fall, warm in the summer, and then cold in like the fall through the winter. So you can grow almost year round here. Mm. And most people have a bad experience with gardening is because they grow predominantly cool season vegetables in the summer and then they die or they bolt and they go to seed and they can't harvest them and they think they did something wrong and the plant was just like doing its thing. Mm. So if, (laughs) yeah, so if, if someone wants to start or even if you're already gardening, like you should garden plan here, like to put it in first, second week of September and then plant cool season vegetables so that's everything in the brassica family like broccoli cauliflower kale um brussels sprouts collards um all of your like lettuces and greens most of your root vegetables like beets radishes um turnips carrots all those are cool season all the asian grains asian grains are amazing that's probably the other thing that i love the most They're way more hardy than anything that's like native here. So they can, about half of them can hire way hotter temps than anything here. And the other half can handle like freezing and snowing. Hmm. So you can grow some greens like straight through the winter here. If you get Asian greens like Chijemisai, I don't know how to pronounce it. Tatsoi. There's some other ones. Um, Interesting. Yeah, so a lot of people think they just like missed the boat because they didn't get their garden in, in the spring. And you literally like whatever day of the year that you're like, <laughs> okay, I have my weekend. I'm starting it. I'm doing it now. Like you can. Yeah. Is it when you do, do it. is it like, would it make the most sense to have like, uh, is it like best to have like two garden beds that you kind of are using for at different times of the year? You know what I mean? I think so. I mean, I, so I live on a quarter acre. The entire back half of the house, which is, I guess, maybe an eighth of an acre, is pretty much 100% growing space. So I would say if you were doing like a four foot, like a four by eight foot bed, I have the equivalent of maybe twenty beds, which like is a lot, and mm-hmm. you don't need that much. But I'm trying to grow enough to like give away and to support some local chefs and like sell. Um, I don't have beds dedicated to seasons. I kind of, I don't, I'm not as great of a planner as I should be, hmm. which surprises people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm very detail oriented and then like my discipline can really <laughs> just <laughs> fall off. Um, so I mostly, I will just plant. And then as I harvest things, I'll be like, wow, there's like a two by two foot gap here. What, what should I plant? And then whatever's in season, that's where it goes. Nice. Okay. And I need to be a little bit better about it. I mean, but that, but. that might be more encouraging in a way. Cause like if, if people like in my brain, I don't want to have, when you were talking about that, I'm thinking that sounds good, but I don't, I've just got my garden going. I don't want yeah. to do a whole nother one. I don't have fence to do a whole nother one. Yeah. So it kind of sounds more enticing to me to be able to like when space frees up, you know, think of it that way. Just like constantly just it. updating it. Yeah. Yeah. It's way more realistic. Yeah. I like that better. Yeah. Just do that. What I really dig about, like, just, I don't know, hearing you talk about this stuff is like, it's one thing to watch a YouTube video. It's one thing to read a book, but I mm. do feel like when you hear somebody actually put things into words and then like I could, I could express to you, I don't fully understand this. And then you can add to it and make me understand it better. Yeah. Uh, I dig that. And I hope that, I hope that, um, I don't know, people who are overwhelmed at the idea of like, they want to do this shit, but they, uh, don't know where to get started. I hope that, I hope they would like use people as resources for, for such a thing. I would love to be that person. I mean, I've started doing consulting, which is a dumb word in this field, it feels like. But it's so valuable to have like an hour of someone's undedicated time to like come to your house and say like, you should do these things, you should not do these things and to answer your questions and like to help you process things that you've heard about or read about that you you understand like 75% but not the rest. So I want to be that 
person. So I'm also doing that. I just kind of do it like as an hourly rate and like, I'll come to your house and we'll talk about it. And sometimes people just want to do perennial flower gardens. Sometimes they want to do all herbs. Sometimes they want a homestead. Sometimes they just want like cut flowers or a small vegetable garden. Um, the man like spending a couple hours with someone that has done it and been there before can spend like, can really save you a couple of years of mistakes Mm -hmm. and, Either, you know, either a lot of money or just like a lot of time yep. collecting things. So, and also just like find someone that's like 80 years old. <laughs> yeah. Like my cousin did. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of grandpas around that have some, <laughs> some good advice. <laughs> Grandpa Lauren, straight yeah. from Grandpa Lauren. Yeah. Uh, well, shit. I think that's, I this think this is so fun. I think, yeah, I think we covered like everything that I was deaf, like that I had to cover that I just like wanted to ask you about. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm probably, you want to go walk around? I can show you around I here a little bit. I would love to see. Yes. All right, cool. Well, Lauren, thank you for doing this. Thank and, you. And, uh, yeah. It's gross stuff. Gross stuff. Gross stuff. <laughs> <laughs>